Welcome to today's program titled Time Well Spent Session 6, The Employment Relationship, Independent Contractors and Joint Employment. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Any unanswered questions will be promptly addressed in the days following the presentation. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials along with the CLE attendance form will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. This presentation has been prepared by Seifarth Shaw LLP for informational purposes only. The material discussed during today's webinar should not be construed as legal advice or a legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The content is intended for general information purposes only, and you are urged to consult a lawyer concerning your own situation and any specific legal questions you may have. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker for today's program, Kelly Kelker. Kelly, please go ahead. Thank you, Donna. Um, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, wherever you may be. Thank you for joining us for today's sixth and next to last session of our Time Well Spent webinar series. Uh, many of you have heard this in one of the earlier sessions, but for those of you joining us for the first time, my name is Kelly Kelker and I'm senior counsel and a member of SciFarth's Atlanta Wage Hour team. One of my jobs here at SciFarth is to update twice a year the Wage Hour Collective and Class Action Treatise published by ALM that's authored by SciFarth attorneys under the leadership of our three editors-in-chief, Brett Bartlett in Atlanta, Noah Finkel in Chicago, and Andrew Paley in Los Angeles. As with the prior sessions, my role here is to keep things moving along so that we can cover in the next 45 minutes a topic that most of you attending today probably have encountered in one way or the other, and that is the question of, is this person who's, who's doing work for our company that benefits our company in some way, an independent contractor or an employee of the company? And this topic is complicated and in flux, and we're fortunate to have with us here today three excellent speakers and an experienced practitioner in that area. First up will be Andrew McKinley, who's a partner in our Atlanta office. Andrew has served as the non-California lead of SciFarth's worker classification group. Of particular relevance to today's presentation, Andrew has been a thought leader around the DOL's new FLSA independent contractor rule. He worked on a set of comments that was cited over 60 times in DOL's commentary to the final rule, including as a basis for adjusting a number of the factors contained in the final rule. Andrew will be presenting today on the state of law under the FLSA with regard to independent contractor classification. Next up will be Eric Lloyd, a partner in SciFarth's San Francisco office. Eric focuses much of his practice on wage and hour class actions. He's a frequent speaker on worker classifications and provides advice and counsel to clients across the country regarding independent contractor relationships. Eric will be presenting today on the always somewhat different California law perspective on independent uh, contractor classifications. We will also hear today from Pam Vardabedian, also a partner in the San Francisco Office Labor and Employment Group, where she focuses most of her practice on California law wage hour class actions. But Pam also handles single plaintiff and counseling matters. Andrew, can you please start things off with a discussion of the new independent contractor rule? Sure. Um, so we'll be talking about the FLSA today. And one thing that is clear under the FLSA is that the statute applies to employees, um, but it does not apply to independent contractors. Would you go to the next slide? Unfortunately, um, the FLSA itself is completely unclear on where that line should be drawn. Um, in fact, the FLSA's uh, definition of employee is about as unhelpful as it could be defines employee as an individual employed by an employer. Um, 
something important to keep in mind is that a worker's preferences as to whether they should be an, an uh, employee or an independent contractor are totally irrelevant. Um, so too is whether they have signed a contract or an independent contractor agreement. Instead, courts have historically adopted a multi-factor economic reality test based on the Supreme Court's decisions in United States for Silk and Rutherford Food Corp vs. Macomb. Um, that test is formulated a lot of different ways by a lot of different circuits, and it looks to um, typically to slightly different formulations of those factors or even additional factors um, based on where you are. But ultimately, the uh, inquiry is whether as a matter of economic reality, the worker depends on someone else's business um, for the opportunity to render services or is in business for themselves. Um, let's go to the next slide. Now, in about the 75 years after the FLSA was passed, um, there were no regulations on what it meant to be an employee or an independent contractor. Instead, the DOL offered um, various sub-regulatory guidance that often changed, um, sometimes in meaningful ways, from administration to administration. In January uh, 2021, the DOL promulgated its first attempt at rulemaking uh, on independent contractor status. That rule elevated two core factors um, above the rest, and that was the nature and degree of the workers' control over the work and the workers' opportunity for profit or loss based on initiative, investment, or both. Under the 2021 rule, if both those factors tilted in favor of one classification, that classification was presumptively the correct classification. The DOL at the time said that it had done an extensive survey of um, case law and that that was the, you know, when both tilted the same direction, invariably that was the result the court reached. Um, if those tilted in different directions, the DOL then said that you look to skill, permanence, and whether the worker was part of an integrated unit of production to determine uh, which side of the line the worker fell on. Ultimately, after an administration change, the DOL unsuccessfully attempted to withdraw the rule. Um, there was a, a legal challenge in, the, um, in, the, in Texas, in federal court, where the, um, the, the court determined that the attempted withdrawal of the rule did not comply with the APA. And so that court um, found that the rule actually went into effect in March 2021, and at least uh, through today, um, that remains the, the rule that is technically in effect, although we're, we'll discuss in a second why that's about to change. Um, let's go to the next slide. Effective March 11th, so next week, um, the DOL's new independent contractor rule is what's going to, to go into effect. Assuming, of course, um, there nothing happens in the next five days, that rule abandons the core factors that the prior tests looked um, focused on, and instead looks to one whether there's an opportunity for profit or loss depending on managerial skill, two um, the investments by the worker in the putative employer, three the degree of permanence of the work relationship, four the nature and degree of control, five the extent to which the work is an integral part of the potential employer's business, six, skill and initiative, and seventh, and, and perhaps most frustrating to everybody hoping for some certainty from the rule, any additional factors that a court determined should be considered based on the particular relationship at issue. Uh, we're going to go through each of these. Uh, I, I think we could probably spend hours going through them in painstaking detail. I'll try to streamline that discussion a little bit and highlight what are the, the most important aspects of each of these factors and, and changes from the prior rule. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, the first factor is the opportunity for profit or loss factor, and that considers whether the worker has opportunities for profit or loss based on managerial skill. Um, and that means that there should be a look to initiative, business acumen, and judgment. Um, the DOL makes clear that working more hours or taking more jobs at a fixed rate is generally not relevant. 
but there were some changes at the final to the final uh, rules commentary that suggest that language should be read exactly as it's stated. Taking more jobs that, for example, pay $15 an hour, knowing that that rate isn't going to change may not be evidence, but the ability to pick and choose between jobs that may be more lucrative or less lucrative um, probably are relevant under this factor um, and are an exercise of business like uh, choices. The DOL suggests that businesses and workers should look to whether there is an ability to determine or negotiate pay, whether the worker has the opportunity to decline jobs, um, whether the worker is engaged in marketing efforts or other efforts to expand the, the footprint of their business, and whether the uh, worker has the ability to hire others, to purchase materials, or to do things like rent space. Let's go to the next slide. The next factor is the investment factor, and this is a pretty significant change from the prior rule. Under the 2021 rule, investment was actually part of the profit or loss factor, and that made a lot of sense. Um, investments are one of the, the clearest ways that businesses are able to increase their profits or de decrease their losses. But the, the DOL now says it has to be treated as an independent factor, and to the extent um, considerations of investment do bear on opportunities for profit or loss. The DOL wants uh, wants business or courts, I suppose, to consider um, consider that fact under both factors. Now, what that ultimately means in practice is unclear. Should it be double counted? Should there be some reduced weight within each factor? Um, the DOL provides no real guidance on that, um, but it does make clear that it should be considered under both. So the investment factor looks to whether investments by the worker are capital or entrepreneurial in nature. And that ultimately, what does that mean? It means does the investment increase the worker's ability to do more work, to reduce their costs, or again, to extend their market reach? Um, and that's important because that probably does mean that the investment has to go beyond what is necessary to do a specific job. Um, for example, if the worker has to buy the lumber that goes into a construction site, that may not be evidence of an entrepreneurial investment. But purchasing equipment, you know, purchasing the hammer, purchasing other uh, heavy tools that can be used across many jobs are probably entrepreneurial in nature. Um, in, in the rule, the commentary to the rule notes that costs unilaterally imposed by the putative employer are generally evidence of employee status. But what that ultimately means is a little bit unclear. Um, the, the commentary seems to suggest that saying you need this particular type of equipment, this particular brand of equipment, I mean, is evidence of employee status. Um, but perhaps just saying you need the tool and you leave it to the worker to pick what that tool is and exercise business judgment in that way doesn't quite cross the line. The, the uh, factor also, I think importantly, calls for a comparison of workers' investments to the potential employers' investments in the overall business. There was some concern previously that this should be viewed quantitatively, meaning in terms of bottom line dollar figures. And obviously that almost always is going to lead towards a balance that favors um, the, the business's expenditures. Uh, but the DOL clarified that really this analysis is supposed to be qualitative and that the inquiry should be whether the worker is making the same types of uh, investments as the business. Let's go to the next factor. The next factor is permanence. Um, and under this formulation of the permanence factor, we're, you're supposed to ask whether the work relationship is indefinite, continuous, or exclusive of work for other employers. Um, the DOL in its commentary does seem to try to cabin the ways that this can be used by businesses. It makes a point of saying that the seasonal or temporary nature of work isn't necessarily evidence of independent contractor status. Um, but in the final rule, um, the DOL does suggest if a lack of permanence is tied to the worker exercising his own business initiative, that that um, reflection of, of a temporary work arrangement may be evidence of independent contractor status. So 
you know, if, if working at a ski resort in winter months, because that's the only time you can, may not itself be evidence of independent contractor status. But if you are, for example, working hitches in an oil field and choosing those hitches based on what company is most lucrative for you to work for, the fact that that's temporary and that may be periodic and recurring um, would seem to still suggest independent contractor status under the rule. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the next and, and probably biggest factor um, in any independent contractor analysis is the nature and degree of control. And this too um, reflects a pretty significant shift from what we saw in the 2021 rule. It considers the putative employer's control, including reserve control over the work and economic aspects of the relationship, including whether the um, worker is able to set their own schedule, um, whether their supervision and discipline or the ability to supervise and discipline, whether the um, business is controlling the prices or rates for services, and whether the um, business is limiting the worker's ability to work for others. Now, one thing that's, I think, really important here is under the prior rule, the focus was placed on the worker's control. And in fact, when we look at the intro to the current rule, it, the DOL seems to acknowledge that one of the important questions is whether the facts suggest that the worker is in business for themselves. Here, however, the DOL says that the control analysis needs to be cabined to what the particular alleged employer's control is. That seems to cut out a lot of the inquiry, right? If, if you're focusing only on that, um, that scope of things, you're cutting out a lot of what the worker could be doing to run their own business apart from that individual relationship. That's where the DOL places the focus now. The DOL also um, takes great pains to make to reject its former position as to actual and reserve control. Previously, the DOL said that actual control is more relevant than re reserve control or control that could potentially be exercised. It didn't say reserve control was irrelevant. It just said it was less important. Now the DOL refused to, refuses to say that. It says it will make no, uh, it will offer no opinion at all about whether reserve control is more relevant than uh, or equally relevant to actual control or vice versa. Um, curiously, it does so without providing even a single example of whether of where reserve control is ever going to be more relevant than actual control. It seems obvious that actual control is what's going to be most um, reflective of the realities of the work relationship. But the DOL has basically left that to businesses and workers to sort out and, and largely speculate about on their own. Uh, let's go to the next slide. The next factor is the integrality factor. Um, this asks whether the work performed is an integral part of the putative employer's business. Basically, that means is the work critical, necessary, or central? Um, Importantly, the, the focus is on the, the um, I, we have it backwards, on the work, uh, not the worker. And, you know, this again is a, is a shift from what we saw in the 2021 rule. Um, there, the question was whether the worker was part of an integrated unit of production, meaning did they look like somebody who was on an assembly line? Instead, now it's just, is it an important part of the business? An integral part of the business and, and that's a really tough standard for any business. Um, we put a quote here from a concurring opinion from judge Easterbrook, where he says that the integrated question is really 1 of those bits of reality that has neither significance nor meaning. Everything an employer does is integral to its business. Why else do it? And, and that's really the way that most businesses look at this standard. Um, and, and it's why most for most businesses, it's going to be. A difficult one um, to fight in, in most litigation settings. Go to the next slide. Skill and initiative um, is the final major factor. Um, this factor looks at whether the worker uses specialized skills to perform the work and whether those skills contribute to business like of an initiative. It's important um, to, to keep in mind the tie to the work. Having specialized skills that you don't actually use in your job isn't. Uh, really relevant of anything under this uh, standard, but the, the rule does add that the skills do have to contribute to business like initiatives. So the, 
although it's titled in the rule as skill and initiative, that's a little bit of a misnomer. You can't treat skill separately from initiative. You have to analyze them together and the skill has to contribute to business like initiative. Again, looking back to what we were thinking about before, does it increase the workers ability to market themselves, increase their customer base, do things that look like a business? Um, the, the commentary to the rule does also note that there should be some consideration to what kinds of trainings are being provided to the worker under the standard. And in fact, if, if the worker is relying on training from a putative employer, that's probably evidence of employee status under the rule. Let's go to the next slide. There is, um, what questions remain after the, uh, about this 2024 20, independent contractor rule? Well, the answer is a lot. Um, it doesn't really tell us what should be considered as one of those additional factors that it said can be thrown into the mix. And so a lot of the, the certainty that the DOL said it wanted to provide really isn't offered by this rule. It also provides no guidance on how to weigh the factors against each other and how to weigh the facts within the factors. Uh, similarly, doesn't really give any guidance on how to weigh facts that are counted in multiple factors. An additional thing that I'll throw in here that I, I glossed over a little bit on the control factor is there are a lot of items under this rule that have historically been considered um, clear evidence of, of independent contractor status. Things like, um, things like being able to work for other companies, being able or, you know, when there are some kind of requirements being placed on workers, if those flow from a legal rule, from a contractual requirement, from anything like that, um, there's not there's not clear statements on how those sorts of things should be handled here. It is clear under the rule that legal requirements aren't necessarily relevant, um, but there is additional language suggesting that if if there's an additional purpose beyond the legal requirement to the requirement, that that could be problematic. And I think you know there's there's an open question here of how these factors will be weighed in, in um, practice and whether that will meaningfully deviate from what the, the 2021 rule suggested. For example, they said that opportunity for profit or loss and control should be weighed as uh, primarily important. Um, they say that flows from case law. Um, there's nothing in this rule that prevents that sort of analysis from continuing to happen. Um, and so there's there, whether courts will continue to focus on those factors is a, is a question. There are also important legal questions, right? Will the, will the courts defer to this rule? I think that's going to depend on the court. That's going to depend on uh, certainly aspects of the rule and, and whether it's comfortable with some or all of it. Um, will the legal challenges to the rule succeed? I, I think there's that same CWI case that invalidated the 2020 or that was successful in challenging the invalidation of the 2021 rule. Um, there was a, an amended complaint filed yesterday with a bunch of new businesses um, where it appears that there's going to continue to be a, cha to be a challenge there. There are actions in uh, Georgia and in other states. Um, eventually, this is going to bubble up to a decision um, and potentially a reversion to the 2021 rule if successful. Uh, will the rule survive an administration change? The last rule didn't. Pretty unlikely that if there's an administration again here, um, the DOL would attempt to revert back to what um, the prior administration tried to do. Um, and will legislative activity gain any traction? Um, there's no no clear path to that right now, but there are certainly efforts, and, and that's something to keep an eye on. So um, the I, that is the picture right now for uh, the, the independent contractor rule and status, status of independent contractors under the FLSA. We'll hand it off to Eric, who I think is about to talk about the same issues under California law and other state laws. Thank you, Edgar. We can go to the next slide. I'm first going to focus on independent contractor laws in California, since on the state level, that's where we've seen the most significant changes in recent years. For about 30 years, California used a multi-factor test for employment that was created in a California Supreme Court case called Borello. Uh, the Borello test primarily turned on the extent of the hiring entity's control over a contractor and also considered a number of secondary factors like whether the worker had any specialized skills, 
whether the worker performed work that was integral to the hiring entity's business, and whether the worker had an opportunity to turn a profit or incur a loss. And then in 2018, the California Supreme Court upended everything in a case called Dynamex. In Dynamex, the California Supreme Court ruled that claims arising from the California Industrial Wage uh, Welfare Commission's wage orders were subject to the ABC test for misclassification instead of the Borello test. And in a later decision, the same court clarified that the Dynamex ruling was retroactive, meaning that it covered potential claims that accrued before Dynamex decision was issued. So what is the ABC test? In short, it's a test that a hiring entity must satisfy in order to defend its treatment of a worker as an independent contractor. And the test has three prongs. If any of those prongs are not satisfied, then a contractor will be deemed misclassified. The three prongs are as follows. A, the worker must be free from the control of the hiring entity. B, the worker must perform work that is outside the hiring entity's usual course of business. And then C, the worker is customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, or business of the same nature as that involved in the work performed. That's kind of a long-winded way of saying the worker has an independent business that does the same kind of work that the worker is performing for the hiring entity. So the Dynamex decision was a pretty big shock to the system, but California wasn't done. In 2020, the California Assembly passed, uh, excuse me, California Assembly Bill uh, 5, which is also known as AB5, took effect. AB5 expanded the reach of Dynamex by making the ABC test the default test for misclassification for all claims arising from the California Labor Code and not just those arising from the California wage orders. Unlike the Dynamex decision, however, AB5 is not retroactive and only applies to work performed on or after January 1, 2020. Another thing AB5 did was to exempt certain professions from the ABC test if certain criteria were met. So if a contractor working in a field covered by an exemption met all of the necessary criteria, then the ABC test would not determine if he or she was misclassified, and instead the Borello test would apply. Let's go to the next slide for a couple of examples of some of these exemptions. Now what I'm about to tell you is very high level because some of these exemptions could be the subject of their own webinar. Uh, first off, let's talk about the business to business exemption. This exemption may apply when two businesses contract with one another, where the service provider, the contractor, is an individual uh, operating as a sole proprietor, a partnership, corporation, LLC, or LLP. And if a long list of criteria is satisfied, then the ABC test will not determine whether that contractor is misclassified. This is a good all purpose exemption that I often bring up with clients who are considering whether to engage an independent contractor in California, but unfortunately it's not easy to meet its criteria. There's also the referral agency exemption. This exemption may apply to the relationship between a contractor and a company that refers out his or her services to its clients. The catch is that the exemption only applies if 11 separate criteria are met. And it's not entirely clear what type of work is covered by the referral agency exemption. The law provides a list of covered occupations, which includes things like graphic design, youth sports coaching, minor home repair, and dog walking. But the statute makes clear that this list is not exhaustive. So we don't really know the full extent of the exemption's reach. Next up is the professional services exemption. This one may apply to contractors who work in marketing, human resources administration, travel agents, or fine artists, name a few. We also have the single engagement exemption. This may apply to contractors who work at a one day event, such as a DJ at a wedding, for example. And then finally, there are exemptions for certain professionals working in the music industry. And these are just a few examples of the many exemptions that may be available. So you'll definitely want to consult your counsel about where these or the other exemptions that are on the books may fit in with your business. Next slide, please. The last bit specific to California that I'll get into for now is Proposition 22. Prop 22 was passed by California voters in 2020 and essentially created a new class of worker. In short, Prop 22 provides that drivers for transportation network companies, think ride sharing, or delivery network companies, think food delivery, are properly classified as independent contractors if certain conditions are met. Those conditions include permitting drivers to choose their schedules and the jobs they accept, permitting them to work for competitors' platforms, and otherwise permitting them to work in any other lawful per, uh, profession or occupation. Next slide, please. 
So workers covered by Prop 22 must receive a number of benefits. For instance, drivers who work at least 15 hours a week must receive a health care subsidy. They're also entitled to a minimum earnings guarantee, which is tied to 120% of the minimum wage with no cap. The workers also receive compensation for their mileage, occupational accident insurance, and protections against discrimination and harassment that wouldn't ordinarily be available to independent contractors. Next slide, please. So where do things stand now? Uh, Prop 22 is currently tied up in the courts. Uh, in March of last year, the California Court of Appeal overturned a trial court decision holding that Prop 22 violated the state constitution. Short version of the appellate opinion is that the appellate court found there was nothing wrong with Prop 22's classification of app-based drivers as independent contractors. Um, that, that was a direct rebuke of the trial court on that front. The appellate court also ruled, however, that Prop 22 violated the separation of powers doctrine because it limited the legislature's ability to pass legislation enabling contractors to collectively bargain. The case is now before the California Supreme Court, and we don't have a timeline for a decision just yet, so a lot of us that practice in the space are anxiously awaiting that outcome. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll share a couple of notes about state laws on independent cr contractor classification other than California. Uh, the long and the short of it is that each state has its own test for independent contractor misclassification, and there's a lot of variance among the states. In fact, a lot of states other than California have adopted the ABC test or some version of it. Massachusetts and New Jersey are good examples there. Other states, uh, other states don't have the ABC test, and instead they have tests based on control over the contractor, economic realities, or something else altogether. Another thing to keep in mind is that one state may have more than one test for independent contractor misclassification, depending on the type of claim at issue. It's not uncommon for a single state to have different tests for wage and hour claims, and then workers' compensation claim on the other hand, for example. And then finally, there was a lot of speculation after AB5 that we'd see a bunch of states implement the ABC test. That hasn't come to pass at this point, but it's still a possibility and definitely worth keeping an eye on. Next slide, please. We're also seeing a lot of movement at the federal level as well. Uh, like Andrew discussed, the Department of Labor's final independent contractor rule was just uh, was just released, and it's already the subject of multiple court challenges. And there's also an upcoming decision from the U.S. Supreme Court on what level of deference to afford administrative agencies' interpretation of laws, which is also known as the Chevron Deference Doctrine. And that decision may have some impact on the independent contractor rule, depending on how broad the Supreme Court's decision is. There's also been a lot of buzz that the FTC may start using the competition laws to target independent contractor misclassification. And then finally, the NLR NLRB last year reversed a prior decision and reinstated a worker-friendly standard for independent contractor misclassification under the National Labor Relations Act in the Atlanta Opera Matter. So there's there's a lot happening at the federal level. This administration has certainly made uh, independent contractor classification a focus. And as Andrew indicated, that could all be upended come November uh, if there's a change in the administration. And with that, I'll turn it over to Pam. Great, thanks, Eric. Thanks, Andrew. Um, all right, so now we're gonna shift the discussion over to joint employment. Um, joint employment is the concept that an employee may be simultaneously employed by multiple entities. So, for example, it often comes up in the scenario where there's a staffing agency and a company where employees are placed. Um, now, this is different than what we've been talking about in terms of independent contractor versus employee classification, because here it's presumed that um, the worker is an employee, uh, but the question is, are they an employee of both entities or one, um, and that's that's what we're talking about in terms of, of the joint employment relationship. Um, in particular, um, I'm going to be focusing on the joint employment under the FLSA, which um, has really been a moving target over the years. Um, and the reason that this is important is um, because, you know, whether or not um, there's an joint employment relationship, there are really large consequences of that. Um, the primary consequences um, being um, that joint employers are jointly and severally liable for the employer FLSA obligations to the employee. 
uh, and the hours worked for each employer during the work week are actually totaled for determining the um, overtime payment obligation. So um, if you're doing it incorrectly, um, there are, are large consequences for this. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so I thought I would just start off with a really brief history here. I'm not going to go into all of the history because there's many years um, that even precede, precede this, but suffice it to say that it has been a moving target and it remains uh, pretty murky at this point. Um, at one point in January 2022, um, during the final days of the Trump administration, uh, there was uh, the deal announced a final rule clarifying its position with respect to whether businesses constitute an individual's joint employer. Um, so there was a, a short period of time where there was a little bit of clarity, um, but those new regulations uh, went into effect March 16th, 2020, um, and they were quickly um, challenged. Um, this did represent the first formal substantive change to the DOL's joint employer guidance in more than 60 years. Um, but uh, when the new administration came in, um, in 2020, uh, like I said, they were challenged and, and shortly after that, um, the DOL rescinded, rescinded its most recent uh, regulation without replacement. So we're at a point now where we're, we don't have a rule that's replaced the Trump era rule. Um, and so we're left with, again, as I said, you know, when I started this, this uh, my portion of the presentation, and we're left with a really, really murky, murky outset here. Um, and it's really ended up now where it's just courts are, are deciding what the rules are. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, there currently does not exist a single uniform test for joint employer status under the FLSA. Um, so, employers are relying on case law now when determining whether or not um, an employer is going to be deemed a joint employer by the courts. Um, and this has largely been filled um, by the federal courts have spoken to this, and they've spawned numerous multi-factor balancing tests, none of which has a achieved consensus support. Um, so the big picture, just stepping back for a second, and assessing whether a worker is an employer independent contractor, the ultimate decision turns on whether the worker is economically dependent upon the putative employer. Uh, by contrast now, when we're talking about the joint employment context, where it's already established that the worker is an employee, the courts assess whether the putative joint employer has sufficient functional control over the employee to be treated as an employer under the FLSA. Um, but like I said, there's no consensus among the circuit courts as to the appropriate factors to be considered in making that assessment. Rather, courts have articulated varying multi-factor tests, often specifically tailored to the industry at issue or the particular facts presented. Uh, and this inquiry is very highly fact intensive. Um, and so therefore, putative joint employers must marshal all available factual support to tip the imprecise balancing in their favor. favor. Um, next slide. And I'm not going to go into the various factors, but um, just to highlight for you um, that the U.S. Courts of Appeals use a variety of different tests, and it really depends on what circuit you're in. Um, so, for example, the first and third circuits use a four-factor test. The second and fourth circuits use a different um, different six-factor tests. Then we have the fifth circuit, which uses a four-factor and five-factor test, each with different factors. And then the Ninth Circuit originally adopted a four-factor test, but later expanded this to a 13-factor test. Um, the Eleventh Circuit uses an eight-factor test. <laughs> so um, lots of different tests out there, lots of different factors. Um, and then also adding to the murkiness of these tests, some courts even say, state when they lay out these factors that none of those factors are exhaustive. Um, and the Circuit Courts have also differed with respect to the relationship analyzed. While some circuits exclusively focus on the putative joint employer's control over the putative employee, other circuits also focus on the relationship between two or more business entities alleged to be joint employers. So the fourth circuit's six-part test, for example, that one considers whether one putative joint employer controls, is controlled by, or is under common control with the other, other putative joint employer as articulated in the 2017 Salinas versus Commercial Interiors decision. Um, so this has implications for certain business relationships, such as between franchisor, franchisee, general contractor, and subcontractor, and the staffing company and client. Um, because these types of relationships inherently require some control by one business over another, there tends to be a stronger argument for joint employer status in jurisdictions focusing on the relationship between 
uh, the alleged joint employers, all other things being equal. Um, the same is true for businesses that require service companies to adhere to quality and safety standards, equal employment opportunity obligations, or other similar requirements, because such requirements may be interpreted, at least where the law is not clear on the subject, as control of one business over another. Um, next slide. So what does this all mean? In some, there's no one-size-fits-all approach to defending joint employment claims, um, given, giving the differing tests and the fact-intensive nature of the inquiry, putative employers should carefully consider the jurisdiction you're in, as well as how the facts of the particular arrangement will fare under the various formulations when developing a defense strategy and advocating for the application of any particular test. Um, whatever factors a court uses to determine the existence of a joint employment relationship, they are all applied against the backdrop of the overriding purpose of the FLSA's joint employment doctrine to prevent situations in which one or more employers seek to avoid their obligations under the FLSA. Um, so employers faced with um, the joint employment claims arising out of their outsourcing arrangements may very well be served by highlighting the public policy arguments favoring a finding that the subcontracting relationship at issue is legitimate, advantageous to the broader economy, and therefore is not an attempt to avoid FLSA compliance. Um, and I'm going to pass it back to Eric to discuss California and other state joint employment tests. And I believe he will read the CLE code right now. Yes, thank you, Pam. CLE code is SS3637. SS is in Seifarth Shaw 3637. Next slide, please. So I'm going to close out by briefly addressing joint employment at the state level. We can go to the next slide. As with independent contractor classification, each state has its own test for joint employment. There's nothing uniform, but generally speaking, the tests focus on control over the workers' terms and conditions of employment. So some of the things that might be considered would be, is the putative joint employer controlling the workers' hours? Are they setting their schedule? Are they providing direct supervision over the worker and directing their work? Are they responsible for setting their pay and benefits? Those are the sort of things that will come into play, generally speaking, although there's there's a broad panoply of factors that are considered, and a lot of them vary by jurisdiction. California, again, is one of the more interesting states here. Its standard test for joint employment for wage and hour purposes is not that unusual, actually. It's uh, essentially a common law test for employment uh, that focuses on control over wages, hours, and working conditions. But one thing to keep in mind about California, which makes it unique, is that there is a statute that renders workers employed by staffing agencies, the joint employees of the staffing agency's clients for purposes of unpaid wage claims and for the failure to secure workers' compensation coverage. So something to be in mind, something to keep in mind when you are entering into contracts with staffing agencies that those workers may very well be your, your joint employees by statute. And that's all I have on joint employment. I can turn it back over to Kelly at this point. Thank you, Eric and Pam and Andrew. Um, I think we have time for one quick question and it's gotta come from me. Um, we talk about joint employment world being ruled by case law and how much that could vary circuit to circuit. And now we hit, and then in the independent contractor realm, we have the remnants of the Trump rule and the new Biden rule. Um, Andrew or Eric, can you talk a little bit about how the rule itself influences court's decision making, the extent to which it does, and how that might change uh, when the Supreme Court rules on the Chevron, Chevron standard about def deference to rules? Uh, Andrew, Andrew, I think you're muted. I see him talking, but yeah. <laughs> Sure. Uh, Eric talked a little bit before about deference, and, and that's that's what it, it comes down to here. Um, ultimately, the the question is is going to be whether uh, courts are persuaded by the rules analysis, which I think in in large measure is is going to be determined by how far it deviates from what the um, circuits those courts are in have previously held, um, and what those judges are used to doing um, historically. So. You know, I, I think that um, realistically, we will see deference where deference is beneficial to judges um, to reach the conclusion they think is most appropriate. And when the rule is uh, arguably at odds with that result, uh, deference is going to be less likely. 
Obviously, if any of these legal challenges are successful, or um, that is going to impact it. Um, I also think it's important to note that uh, the legislation or the the rulemaking is forward looking, right? There there is no, in my view, no legitimate argument for retroactive retroactivity. So for cases currently pending, um, we're still going to be in a world of looking at what does the case law provide for. Um, arguably, what did the, the Trump rule apply for if that was in place during the relevant time um, for those cases? Going forward, there's going to be more uncertainty on the difference front. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you all for joining us today uh, for this update. Uh, on the screen, you'll see information, uh, Donna, about um, the last two, the last, very last session of our series, which is on what is work, which will explore uh, time basically spent by workers and whether they must be compensated for it in things such as security check, travel time, and the like. Um, we hope your schedule will allow us to join that. Look uh, in your email for information about the scheduling of that in the next uh, couple of months, and we hope you will join us then. Thank you very much.